Hello, good morning, good afternoon. I'm Father Shane, if you don't know me, sorry, well obviously. So week four of this campaign, uh, we know each other pretty well at this point and we're going deeper into what our Lord's telling us about why we're Catholic. Why we're Catholic and what, what the scriptures say about that. What does the Bible say about why I should be Catholic? Well, as we've seen, the Bible says a lot, right? And we've learned too that the Bible, this really special book that God's given us, this love letter from God to me and you, well, it's just part of a much bigger picture. This isn't the only thing we've got that's going to get us to heaven. In the first place, obviously, it's, the res it's Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection which bought for us that salvation that we so much desire that we can get into heaven thanks to him. But also, he didn't just leave us the Bible. He left us, more importantly, our church, a home, a family. He brings us into his family through baptism and in that church, he's given the Holy Spirit, so that the whole, the whole church is guided by the Holy Spirit in the ways of God, in the truth of God. And thanks be to God, he will never leave us. He will never abandon us. We'll hear from a lot of other people that you shouldn't be Catholic because God somehow abandoned his church at some point or stopped giving his church the gifts or the, the church somehow wandered away from the truth of God at some point. Well, that's what you have to believe if you're going to believe anything else, right? If you're going to come up with your, your own interpretation of Scripture, your own doctrines, well, you've got to say something like that. Anyway, thanks be God, it's not true. And the hierarchy, the bishops, priests, and deacons continue to guide us, as, as we heard in a couple weeks ago, continue to guide us according to the great traditions of the church. And it's that same church that gave us the Bible, right? Same church that determined what the books of the Bible would be. All right, let's talk a little bit about the Bible. Uh, we've talked a lot about the Bible, but, uh, but let's talk about holy books in general. Just kind of see where this fits, right? We'll hear a bunch of terms. For example, the Hebrew Scriptures, the Bible of the Jews. What is that? Well, it's just simply what we would call the Old Testament, right? In the times of Jesus, the Catholic version here, which has uh, 46 books in the Old Testament, those 46 books were what Jesus read. Now, nowadays, if you pick up a Protestant Bible, you, you count and you'll only get, oops, 39. And a couple more books will also be shorter. And you kind of say, wait a minute, 39 doesn't, doesn't make sense. What, how'd, you get, how'd you get 39 books and, and, and the Catholics have 46? Well, if you pick up the Jewish version as well, it'll have 39 books. Why? About 50 years after the resurrection of Jesus, the Jews got together and said, uh, let's look through the scriptures. And they took the Bible that, that everybody had been using, Catholics and Christians and followers of Jesus, as well as the Jews, and they said, look, these seven books, they, they don't seem to have been written originally in Hebrew. So let's get rid of those. Now, we, we kept them the whole entire time. And actually, strangely enough, it's been found through more research that there were original Hebrew versions of at least a couple of those books anyway, but whatever. Uh, the criterion they were using at the time was well, if it wasn't written in Hebrew, the official language of the scriptures, originally, then it, it couldn't possibly be from God. Well, whatever. That was their interpretation at the time. The fact of the matter is, the Catholics and the Christians kept using this version of 46 books. It was what Jesus used. There are references to Maccabees clearly in the letter to Hebrews, for example. Maccabees is one of the books, uh, First and Second Maccabees are two of the books that got sort of ejected from the Old Testament by that decision. Okay, no problem. So what we've got is 46 books. If you pick up a Protestant Bible, what's the difference? Just that. There's seven books missing. How critical are those seven books? Well, the Word of God, right? So in, in that sense, it's part of the whole. How critical are they? How much time do we spend reading them? Well, it depends. Actually, the Book of Wisdom is extremely deep, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pick up the Book of Wisdom several different times during the year in our readings on Sunday Mass, for example. Um, and then, anyway, the rest of the, the, rest of the books are... There's a lot there. Uh, the book of Sirach, for example, is extremely deep and extremely, um, it's, it's on the long side and there's a lot there that if, you're, if you pick up a Protestant Bible, you're just missing, that's all. All right, so the Jews have the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. Um, the Torah is just the first five books of that, the most important, most important books, or the most found, foundational, fundamental books of the Old Testament. That's kind of what everything else uh, depends on. Anyway, now, after that, you get the New Testament, 
written by the first followers of Jesus. It's all written by the apostles and by people who are associated with them, right? So that all happens within roughly 50 years after the passion, death, resurrection of Jesus. Okay, what about after that? Well, you've heard of the Quran, right? That's Muhammad as the foundational book for, the, um, for Islam. Excellent, fantastic. Um, but who wrote that? Well, he said it was dictated to him. Okay, no problem. So that's their belief, that that's a holy book as well. It's not our belief because our belief is once the apostles died, once the generation of the apostles died, tradition, the tradition that God wanted to give us about our salvation was concluded. Like we mentioned last week, right? If somebody shows up and says that they have a vision from God, a revelation from God now, that's fine, but I don't need that for my salvation. I don't need that to go to heaven. Maybe it will help me in my spiritual life, but it won't. I don't need it to go to heaven. Everything I need is here and in the traditions of the apostles. So the book of the, the Quran, the Book of Mormon, written, in, written down in the 1800s, Joseph Smith in upstate New York. Okay, the Book of Mormon doesn't, isn't, isn't part of it either, right? So you can, you can get a free Book of Mormon if, <laughs> if, you're, if, you're nice to, if you're nice to somebody from the Church of Latter-day Saints, right? And um, you can even get a, a free Quran sometimes if, you, if, you, uh, if, if somebody's working on converting you. It doesn't happen very often, but happens sometimes. And online, certain people are getting a little more aggressive in the way they're trying to convert Catholics to Islam. All right, whatever. Um, one, other, one other thing, be careful of this. If you get a Bible from the Jehovah's Witnesses, wow, uh, careful. They changed the text of the Bible. They're the only ones ever to do that. Right? The only other, only other modifications made to the Bible have been, like, for example, removing those seven books um, that we talked about before. But actually changing the text of, for example, Hebrews 1, nobody had dared to do that in the entire history of Christianity up until the early 20th century with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Anyway, um, yeah, no comment on, on what that would look like at your final judgment if you have to go before uh, the judgment seat of God and say that you changed the scriptures, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but literally, the words, the words have been changed in the, in the version that the Jehovah's Witnesses have. Anyway, what's so beautiful about having the Old Testament and the New Testament? Occasionally, you'll hear people say, we should only follow the Old Testament or we should only follow the New Testament. We have both, and it's very much on purpose. The Old Testament points the way towards Christ. And little by little, you see this progressive education that the people of God are receiving. And little by little, they're finding out more about who Jesus would be and what the fullness of salvation is. And then the New Testament is the fullness of that. So it's a sort of um, dimly perceiving, but getting a lot of lessons. First of all, the Ten Commandments, for example. Ten Commandments are straight out of the Old Testament, obviously. But then Jesus takes that to the next level and says, the one commandment I give you is love. And that sort of sums up everything all together. And it's just, you know, going from something that's very, very good, very true to something that's exceptionally perfectly true. And you, you're sort of discovering little by little deeper and deeper what, what God wants. Or for example, what, um, well, for example, where the names themselves come from. Old Testament, New Testament, trivia. Testaments from the Latin word testamentum. What's testamentum mean? It means covenant. Oh, that's what we talked about in Lent. Yeah, covenant is this agreement between God and man, not a, not a contract, but a binding partnership of love between man and God. So over and over, the covenant gets offered. The old covenant and the new covenant? Yeah, here's why. Uh, check this out. Exodus 24, I love this. Moses is making a sacrifice, the sacrifice of the covenant. Something has to die in every covenant, at least the way the, uh, the Old Testament does it, right? Something has to die. Oh, the New Testament does too because Jesus dies for the new covenant. Oh, wow. Okay, anyway, so uh, Moses took the blood of the bulls that they had sacrificed and splashes the blood on the people, sprinkles them with blood. Why? Because that blood falling on them, uh, the blood of the bull, the death of the bull is to bring them new life. Okay, so the blood splashed on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Wait, what? That sounded like something. So Exodus 24, Luke 22. Jesus at the Last Supper, what's he say? He took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which will be shed for you. And so Jesus, just like Moses, gives blood. 
but he doesn't give the blood of bulls to bring new life, to bring forgiveness from sins in a sort of temporary way. He gives his blood, which forgives sins in a permanent and full way. Wow, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant. Sacrifice of the Old Covenant, bulls. Sacrifice of the New Covenant, Jesus. Forgiveness of sins, temporary. Forgiveness of sins, permanent. There's all kinds of things like that. And the deeper you get into the Bible, the more you discover it. So, so to hear somebody say, well, I, I, we're, just, we're just only going to focus on the New Testament or only focus on the Old Testament, mm, God, didn't, God didn't intend for us to do it that way. Anyway, talk about two things really quick. One, uh, just sort of like other things that you can hear on the street. First one is Mary. Second one is Father. So, first of all, Mary. Mary, oh no, that's what they always bring up when I'm on the street. How many people worship Mary? When I went to college, I, I had to, we had to, it, was, it was four of us in two rooms connected by a bathroom. That's how the dorm was made. One guy comes over from the other room just right after we'd all been dropped off by our parents. Our parents had left. And the guy comes over and kind of looks at me and says, Are you Catholic? I said, yeah, you know, because for him it was something exotic because he come from a town with almost no Catholics in Nebraska, right? So he gets it, are you Catholic? I said, yeah. He says, you people worship Mary. And I said, yeah. And I said, oh, wait, um, I don't know. I don't know, wait, no, 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 we don't worship Mary. And I said, oh, I, I don't know, right? And that was sort of the start of this, like, year of uh, where I had to learn the faith, so in the battleground, right? And, and being constantly bombarded with objections to our faith, right? And it's fantastic, helped me learn it. Um, you know, made some, made some lifelong friendships there anyway, but it was a little different, right? A little different with a bunch of uh, pretty opinionated uh, people, apparently. Uh, each one coming with, with the traditions, different traditions, different things we've been taught. So, do we worship Mary? No, we do not worship Mary. I was dead wrong. I was a stupid college freshman at that point. All right, you know, though, we don't worship Mary. What's worship? Worship is what you offer to God. Incense is for God because it's like the, the prayer going up, the worship going up. The, the, um, anyway, Mary though, the saints, do we worship them? No, but we, we venerate them, right? In the same way, if you take a picture of my mother and tear it up in front of me, um, I cannot guarantee that I will treat you in a very Christian way about that, right? Why? Because it's so important to me, right? And if you're disrespecting my mother, I'm going to care a lot about that, right? Because, because I would expect you, uh, I venerate her, right, as my mother. She, I have a, she has a special place in my life, right? And I'm sure for you it's exactly the same way with your mother, right? She's a special person to you. Well, same with Mary and the saints. We're going to venerate them. We're going to honor them in the same way that we would honor an Olympic gold medal winner, honor the president by singing a special song when he comes, you know, hail to the chief and all that. We honor people that way. The same with the people that we care most about in our spiritual family. And the same with the people who are closest to God in our spiritual family, Mary and the saints. We venerate them. Mary said we would. It's in Luke 1. She said, all generations will call me blessed. The angel said it to her. The angel said, if you are, um, you are, you are full of grace, overflowing with God's gifts. You know, it's all, it's all from Luke 1. All we're doing is simply living out what she said we would live out and what well, we're doing what the angels themselves do in Mary's presence, which is honoring, honoring all the gifts that God's given her. We're not praying to her as a goddess. If you do that, oh gosh, no, it's not Catholic, all right? And we can kind of give that impression if we're not careful, but we, we don't. We're just simply asking Mary to pray for us to God. We're not praying to her so that she do miracles. We're praying to her so she asks her son to do a miracle, because after all, he's her son. And she's our mother, too. John 19, Jesus gives... Mary, as a mother, to John, the beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, who's, who's kind of representing all of us. And, and from that moment, the disciple takes her into his house. Check it out, Luke 19, I'm sorry, John 19, 25 to 27. Very important passage because it tells us that, yes, Mary is meant to be the mother of all of us. That's why I'm standing before this really beautiful uh, image that we have of Mary. She's kind of in the corner. You don't see her very often if you're coming to Mass, maybe. Uh, this looks sort of classic Italian style. Um, uh, icon of Mary that we've got. So anyway, all the different images of Mary that we've got all over church this is just simply one more. And it reminds us, as all of them do, that her claim to fame and her claim to her claim on our heart has to do with who she's holding in her arms. She's holding baby Jesus. Because she's the mother of God is why she's so important to us. 
She's not only God's mother, she's also our mother. And then finally, we are called father, if you're a priest. Is that a big deal? Well, Jesus said you shouldn't call anybody on earth father. Oops, well, maybe it is. And sometimes you'll hear that. You know, Why do you call priest father? Jesus said never to call anybody on earth father. All right, look. But Jesus himself, what did he say? Luke 18, 20. Honor your father and your mother. Wait, he's telling people to honor their father and mother? Uh, St. Paul, Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents. Oh, wait. You're not supposed to call him father. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, what? Luke 16, 24, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Sort of in a spiritual way. Abraham wasn't really the father of the person who's saying it. Or Galatians 4, 19, St. Paul says, My children, for whom I am again in labor until Christ be formed in you. Wait a minute. So, all right, hold on, hold on. So Jesus says, don't call anyone on earth your father. And yet, all through the rest of the New Testament, people get called father all the time. Jesus said, don't call anyone on earth, uh, you know, teacher. Well, um... How are you going to do it at school then if you're not supposed to call anybody a teacher? What's it mean? It means that be careful about letting a human being become for you a teacher that takes the place of God. If somebody on earth is your father to the extent that you, you forget about God and you follow only the teachings of that man, that is absolutely not God's will for you. That is absolutely not what the church teaches, right? Why is a priest called father? Because, well, he's a spiritual father in, in baptism to people. He's a spiritual father for, for you. The, one, the priest who baptized me is my spiritual father. The priest who baptized you is your spiritual father because with that you came into God's family. How important is it uh, that I be called father? Well, not, not very important. It's, it's a title. A priest is better. You could say reverend if you feel like it. It's all good, right? We say father because it's just a way of of saying thank you to someone for, for having been that, that spiritual leader, spiritual guide, but spiritual father bringing us into, into God's family. So how much do we care about that? Are we totally wrong, <laughs> as, as we brought up before, right? If, if we're totally wrong about that one little tiny point in the great big picture of things, does it matter that much anyway? Well, for some people, if we're wrong about that, the whole thing stands and falls on one tiny little point being off whatever. I'm confident that it's perfectly all right to use the word Father as we do, as has been the tradition of the church for, forever, right? And even as St. Paul used it, it's not, it's not that big a deal, right? Thanks be to God, we're fine. And remember, all those objections, there's an answer. Check out catholic.com. Google that. Google it. You'll be good. Anyway, so next time somebody comes up, just remember, you're Catholic for a reason. And there's a good reason for everything that we do as Catholics. So we'll see you next week for the fifth and final week of our campaign. May God bless you and have a great discussion now.